Hey everybody, wanted to make a quick video about parallax occlusion mapping. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I wanted to cover in my first draft of this video. It ended up being about an hour long, so I think instead I'm going to be cutting it into parts. Um, so first thing here I wanted to talk about is just a performance optimization. So right now I've got a really basic uh, parallax occlusion material. So we've just got kind of your standard parameters up in the top corner here uh, that I think most people are going to be familiar with and if you're not uh, you know this probably isn't the video for you this is not your uh, introduction to parallax occlusion mapping but um, you see we've got our height map height ratio uh, minimum steps is the default max uh, I've got a parameter some UVs height map channel and reference plane and those are all just being fed into um, the nodes from here to keep things a little less ugly. Um, and we're taking the UVs, throwing them into some texture samples, and we're getting our material. And I've got the specular turned off just to make it so there's less glare uh, for the video. Um, so this is probably pretty, you know, pretty much what everyone is going to be doing with their parallax occlusion mapping when they first uh, start out. But there's a couple of things I wanted to show you guys. And the first thing um, we are just going to bring up our stat GPU for. So if I come down here to be roughly in line here where it's kind of at its worst case scenario, we'll see we've got our base pass currently as about one millisecond, which is pretty good. Uh, if we go into our Parallax material here. Um, I'm going to go to the texture. This is the height map in the um, blue channel here. And rather than using the default texture group, I am going to change this to trilinear. And what you'll notice is my base pass has now been cut in half from about a millisecond to a half a millisecond. Uh, and the reason for that is that texture filtering samples your texture multiple times, right? Um, anisotropic filtering in particular can sample the texture an insane number of times. And when you're on the default group, um, quite typically that's going to be anisotropic. It depends on how your texture groups are configured, but the standard grouping for just any normal texture is going to be anisotropic uh, for the normal uh, setting, uh, although you can, again, customize that. So by setting it to trilinear, um, we are still multiple, uh, taking multiple samples, but we're taking far fewer than we would with anisotropic, especially when we are at these glancing angles where anisotropic is meant to do its thing. And you'll notice that there really isn't any quality difference here. And the reason is because we're only changing uh, the setting for this one texture, the base texture, the normal map, they're all still using anisotropic filtering. Now, in this case, it also has the occlusion map and the roughness map in the same texture, um, which means that you're also going to be slightly lowering the quality of the texture filtering on those two maps as well, uh, in the case of like a Megascans texture. Um, so you, if that's a problem for you, you might need to split your displacement map into a different texture and not pack it. Um, but Ultimately, that's a huge win, and especially if you're going to be using large numbers of um, samples, right? If I bump this up to something crazy, let's go with uh, 256, um, and set this to default. I'm also just going to set my minimum step. So I've just got a consistent step quantity. So now our base pass is going to be really high, uh, almost you know, 2.8, almost 3 milliseconds. And then if we again go in here, let's try linear. Now we're at 1.5. 
So just to make that a little more dramatic. Um, so let's go ahead and set this back to uh, something a little more sane. All right. So that's the first thing I wanted to cover, and that's just that's basically just free performance. There's really no reason to use anisotropic filtering with um, parallax occlusion mapping. You're going to exponentially sample the texture, and it is just going to destroy performance. So uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is MIP maps. So this might be a little bit hard to show, So especially with the default texture. So I'm going to switch over to uh, this. And if we go in, try to find an area where this is going to be noticeable. Maybe. Yeah. So you'll notice um, that uh, there's this kind of halo effect around certain areas. And I've mentioned this before in some of my other videos, but this has to do with uh, the derivatives, screen space derivatives that are used for calculating uh, MIP maps. So what we would need to do to fix this, and I'll explain it in more detail here in a second, but I'm just going to show it to you first, is to change this from using the computed MIP level to using a derivative MIP level, which will give us the DDX and DDY input. So then what you'd want to do is take texture coordinates with a DDX and a DDY, and then plug them in. So now, again, if I take our normal parallax UVs, you'll see that we have this, um, this haloing around uh, the height map. And if we use the regular texture coordinates, it's gone. And so the reason that this happens, if we start previewing this here, is when you have um, screen space derivatives, DDX, DDY, they're a measure of the rate of change in, in this case, the texture coordinates. And that's how it decides which UV, um, excuse me, which um, MIP map level it's going to use. The greater the rate of change, the higher MIP and therefore the lower quality it's going to be because the greater the range of change you see in your texture coordinates usually means the farther away the pixel is, right? So in this case, as we get closer to the texture, you can see it gets dark. As we get farther from it, it gets bright, um, which is basically saying greater rate of change. But you'll also notice that around the edges of the height map, we are also getting a greater rate of change. And that's because when we look at our uh, our UVs, this might be hard to see here, but maybe if I uh, go unlit, if we look at our UVs, we can hopefully see these um, uh, you know, it's not a consistent gradient, whereas a normal texture coordinates is, right? It's just a consistent gradient. And because of that, we get DDX and DDY looking like this instead of like this, right? So we really don't want to have rapid changes in our screen space derivatives of our UV maps. It'll mess with our texture sampling. Um, now, depending on the type of texture, this might not be that big of a deal. In this case, this is um, just a you know, mostly gray texture, right? So uh, when the MIP map levels don't line up, it's not particularly noticeable. But we still would want to go in here, set these to derivative. Grab our DDX and DDY. Plug them in. So 
may or may not be able to tell the difference on something like this. But it definitely does make it sharper. Whether you can see this on YouTube, I don't know. But maybe if I um, throw in a blurb. Hopefully you can see that here with the parallax UVs, it's kind of blurry. And as we bring it over to the texture coordinate UVs, rather than being gray, we get some of our details back. So you definitely want to be using DDX and DDY here. So that about covers, I think, what I wanted to discuss in the first video. I will be doing more videos on parallax occlusion mapping uh, that will cover uh, performance and visual quality, and um, hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.